Well, thank you for that. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to take them. We'll go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 19. Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 19. And we certainly are grateful to uh, have the clerks with us today and be with us in the evening service tonight as well. So if you enjoy good gospel music, let me encourage you to be back tonight. A little bit more time sometimes in our evening service than we do in our uh, morning service. And so again, we're certainly thankful that they can be here. Matthew chapter number 19 is where we'll find our text. And of course, we have kind of proclaimed today as um, an emphasis on the home and family. And that, uh, of course, is, is, our, uh, is our theme and our focus throughout this day. And of course, uh, we oftentimes think of the month of February, and I suppose our minds go to this sort of thing because Valentine's Day appears right in the middle of this month. And so we're thinking about love and all of these types of things. And uh, the greatest love, I suppose, that can be found uh, in all of the world, apart from a spiritual sense, of course, is the love that we consider in our homes and our families, between husbands and wives and between parents and children and children and parents. And so we're going to look in Matthew's Gospel today. We're going to consider uh, the subject today, and the title of the message is Marriage, What God Hath Joined Together. Marriage, What God Hath Joined Together. Would you stand with me if you found your place and you're able to, as we read uh, the 19th a chapter here of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, just the opening few verses, verses 1 down through verse number 6. The Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain, or they two, shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the book was sung about just a moment ago, and Lord, without it, where would we be? We would know so little about you. The Bible does tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork, but Lord, that's a general revelation. It tells us that you're out there and that you exist and that you're mighty and powerful, but Lord, it does not give us any much more detail than that. Lord, you saw in your infinite wisdom to give us a Bible. Lord, it tells us how we can be saved, how we can know Jesus, how we can have our sins forgiven. It tells us about the church and how we ought to conduct our lives. And Lord, I'm so very thankful that it tells us how our families ought to behave and operate, how our marriages ought to be a commitment for life. Lord, we thank you for Jesus' words here in this scripture on marriage and the home and family and the emphasis that is placed on this covenant relationship that is intended to last a lifetime. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our homes and our families today, that you would strengthen our commitment and our resolve toward one another, those of us that find ourselves in a marriage relationship. I pray perhaps for singles that are in this audience this morning that certainly are praying that at some point God would bring a, a, a lifelong spouse into their lives. I pray perhaps that they'll consider some of the truths that are talked about today. Lord, it'll shape and define them moving forward so that they can make a wise decision about this. Pray that you would meet with us and stir in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When I say August 5th, 2000, what do you think about? Probably most of you, I don't know, it was a long time ago. That was nearly 18 years ago and Maybe you can kind of give me a general idea of what was happening in your life at around that period of time. Oh, I was just getting ready to start my senior year of high school, or uh, perhaps maybe that was the year I graduated from kindergarten, or maybe that was the year that I got my driver's license. You might be able to give a, uh, some, some kind of generalized facts or thoughts about that day, but if you ask me or if you ask my wife about August 5th, 2000, there's a gleam in our eye. A wicked smile comes across our face, a grin. Why? Because that's our anniversary. I'm not allowed to forget that day. 
it's, it's written everywhere in, in my mind so that I don't forget. That was the day that my wife and I stood on this very platform and we committed our lives to each other. That's a special day. Now, if you, if you say August 5th of 1997 or August the 5th of 1985, I have no idea what I was doing on that day or what was happening on that day, but August the 5th of 2000, I can tell you exactly what was going on in my life. Man, I can tell you the food I ate that day. I can tell you the suit of clothes that I wore. And, and, uh, and, and I can tell you the car that I was driving on that day. And I can give some, some details about that day because it, it means a lot. That's the day that I got married. So I was thinking about marriage a little bit this week. I thought about the fact that weddings and marriages, weddings in particular, that's a beautiful thing, are they not? Weddings are very, very special. Did you know that I, 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 I don't know how, the, how true this is, but seem, seems I found it on the internet, so it must be true. The average, the average cost of a wedding in the United States of America today is $26,720. That does not include, it does not include the honeymoon. That's just the wedding. I read that statistic in my office this week and I wept because <laughs> I have three daughters and I'm going to go meet the justice of the peace this week. We're going to get on a first name basis and they're going to get to know that guy in a, in a real close way. Because I can't afford $26,000 weddings. Probably most of you can't either. But when you average the cost together of what most people spend on a wedding, it comes to right in that, right in that ballpark, $26,720. That's a lot of money. As an engaged couple, as they sit down to plan their special day, much consideration is given to things. And as we begin to talk about these, you'll understand why this number goes so high. Things like dresses and flowers. You know how much flowers cost? I told my wife, get the fake ones. They're a whole lot cheaper, you know. We can have them for a long time, but flowers and dresses and, and, and food and a rental hall and a, and a church and then the honeymoon. And that's just, that's all on one day and a couple of days that come after it. But a marriage is supposed to last a lifetime. The guest list is carefully chosen and invitations are sent out. Perhaps some form of premarital counseling is administered. A marriage license is acquired. A rehearsal is done in anticipation of the next day's wedding. It's a very special time. And it all builds to a crescendo when the minister pronounces the couple husband and wife and instructs the man that he may kiss the bride. The most recent wedding I did, something, something snapped inside of me. I'm not exactly sure what it was. But in the rehearsal, we were going through the rehearsal. We got to that point, and I looked at the, at the man that was getting married, and he's standing across from what would be, the next day would be his bride. And I said, uh, you, I now pronounce you husband and wife. It's just rehearsal. And I said, you, sir, may high-five your wife. <laughs> they smiled. They laughed. They didn't think that I would dare do it the next day, but I did. <laughs> and then I said, no, I'm kissing. I'm kissing. I'm kidding. You may kiss. You may kiss your bride. And it all builds to that, the excitement and, and the enthusiasm. And isn't it sad that with all of the money spent, all of the plans made, and all of the hopes and dreams that we envision for a happy home and a happy life, isn't it sad that nearly 50% of all marriages today now end in divorce? I um, perhaps will be a little transparent with you. Maybe I shouldn't feel like this, but there are times in which I walk into a wedding, and I sometimes have to ask myself, I wonder how long this one will last. And that may, that may sound humorous, but it's really sad. That's not at all what God intended. That was never God's plan. God's plan was, was a commitment between two people for life. I think what happens a lot is we make all of these plans and we're thinking about each other and our tastes and our likes and what we want and what our desire is. And we carefully choose our guest list and, and there's someone that's left out of this special day. It's not the father of the bride or the father of the groom or the mothers or it's not any of the family members. The, the person that often is left out of this special day is well, he's really the one that invented marriage in the first place. He's the one that came up with this whole idea. 
He's the one that developed it. He's the one that instituted it. He's the one that gave it to us. And I'm just, here to, I'm just here to tell you that I believe that of all the gifts that God has given, this ranks right up there at the very top. There's salvation without question. No greater gift in all of the world than that. But if God has blessed you with a, with a wonderful husband or a wonderful wife, you've experienced one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given. And we find that God gives some interesting thoughts on marriage because we believe Jesus Christ to be deity. We believe him to be the son of God. We believe him to be God in the flesh. And we find that he gives some thoughts about marriage in this passage of scripture that well, I think we ought to consider. Number one, I want you to consider in this passage, we learn of the perspective of the world about marriage. We find that in verse number three, where the Pharisees came unto him, the Bible says, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put his wife away for every cause? Now that phrase at the end of that verse, every cause, is, is indicative of an attitude. It's indicative of a, of, of a spirit that dwells within a lot of men and a lot of women today regarding marriage. We see from this passage of Scripture the truth about marriage. And here's the truth. Living peacefully with another human being is a great challenge. It's not easy. Those of you that perhaps have been married for a significant portion of time, you understand that when you got married, you brought your own personality and all of your little idiosyncrasies into your, into your marriage. I've said this before, but my, my, my wife grew up in a different home than I grew up in. And, and don't we all just think that the way that we do things is right? Like, like don't you think about you, the way you look, look at things? And don't I think about the way that I look at things? Well, I'm just right about everything. You, you, you don't laugh because you think the same thing. You go throughout your, your life and throughout your day, and you just, we all operate under this assumption that my opinion is just right. Your, your opinion, if it's different than mine, well, I'm sorry that you're mistaken, but you are mistaken. My opinion is right. That's how most people think. That's how most people operate. And so you bring a person that thinks he's always right, a man who thinks he's always right, and you bring a woman who knows she's always right, <laughs> and you bring those two things together, and we've got a real challenge. This is hard. This is really difficult. For instance, I am not a coffee drinker at all. I think it's disgusting. I, I'm weird. I love the smell of coffee. I'm talking about opening up the can and smelling it. Oh, I love that smell. If they made it a cologne, I'd probably wear it. <laughs> but I can't stand the taste. I think it tastes disgusting. There's a couple of things. I am the son of Kevin Folger, so I'm about as impatient as he is. And so when I go to drink something, I don't want to have to wait for it to cool down. I just want to guzzle it and move on, you know? And so that's part of the problem. Well, my wife, my wife thinks that, my wife thinks that coffee is, is some experience that you have every morning. It's like meeting with God. I'm going to sit down with my cup of coffee and I'm going to hold it lovingly in my hands. I'm going to stare at it longingly. And I want, my, I want my husband to sit across the table from me and do the same. It's not happening. She has told me on more than one occasion, I wish that we could have a cup of coffee together. I said, we can have a cup of Diet Coke together if you want. <laughs> so we're just different. And we come together, and she thinks one way, and I think another. And it's a challenge. It's hard work. There are times, there are times where, where I don't, not, not, do, not only do I think she's wrong, but I don't like the way she thinks. Like, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's right. I, I think that I'm right. I think we ought to do things my way. And, and we understand that the two people, two selfish people that have a sin nature, them coming together and trying to fit their lives together and living under the same roof and moving together in the same direction as a team, man, that's going to present some great challenges. And the Pharisees came to Jesus, and with that thinking in mind, uh, they, they basically said, well, well, I mean, can we just end this thing for any cause? Because, you know, sometimes marriage is really hard and we just want out. 
Can I, can I tell you that we see the perspe- perspective of the world about marriage when we see this question that's asked here, and that is this. If it gets too hard, we should both have the option to just move on. I mean, that's the attitude that's portrayed here. Every cause, every cause. When I read that, I, I thought, well, every cause means I don't love her anymore. Every cause means we've grown apart. Every cause means we just stay together for the kids. And now that the kids are grown and gone and, and we're looking just for the every cause, now it's time for us to, to move apart and live our own lives. Every cause is he's changed and he's no longer the man that I married. Every cause is I finally met my soulmate. I finally met, I know that this is God's will. We just think so much alike. Every cause is, this is God's will. Every cause is, I'm not happy. And doesn't God want me to be happy? I mean, I could go on and on, listing some of the things that I have read, or maybe even some of the things that I have heard from a man or from a woman who is married, but they're looking for a way out. And their attitude is, if it gets too hard, if it gets too difficult, then I should should be able to move on. The philosophy today is that marriage is not a covenant for life, but rather it's something that we should have the option to walk away for any reason if we so desire. Our culture has seen so much divorce that it has created, I'm telling you, it has created a negative feeling toward marriage among many of my generation and the generations that are coming behind me. They they view marriage, they look at marriage, and they hear the term and they almost... They almost chuckle. They they have a cynical view towards the covenant of of marriage between a man and a woman. And they almost view it as somewhat of a joke. That's the world's perspective on marriage. But I want you to notice, we see here that the plan of God for marriage is clearly given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ in verses 4 to 6. I want you to notice that in this plan, Jesus addresses three specific things. You want to know from the inventor of marriage, the one who came up with it, you want to know what it should look like and and how it should operate? Well, he he gives you in in, in almost bullet points, verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6, he gives us three things that we ought to know. The plan of God, first of all, clearly addresses gender. It's unmistakable. Verse number 4. Jesus is speaking. And he says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? What do you think he's trying to say here? He's trying to say this. First and foremost, marriage, as instituted by God, is between a man and a woman. It's unmistakable. You you, you cannot miss that in the word of God. It It is clear as day. And I understand. I understand we are living in an unusual time. And I understand there are even laws on the books in the United States of America that may provide and allow for some other things. But I also understand we ought to obey God rather than man. And that as God's people, we have to hold the standard and where God established the standard. And the standard of marriage, the plan for marriage as far as God's concerned, addresses gender. That marriage is destined, it is designed to be between one man and one woman. It addresses gender. But notice, secondly, It addresses monogamy. Notice verse number five. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. There is only one plural term that is given in this passage of Scripture. And the plural term is twain, speaking of two, speaking of one man and one woman coming together and being one flesh. In other words, in in God's design for marriage, there is no room for outside influences. There's there's no room for, for anyone but husband and wife in a marriage. This is what God has designed. This is what God has planned that a marriage relationship is between one man and one woman. Now listen, the scriptures are, are filled with plural marriages. I mean, they're from, almost the, from almost the beginning of the Bible to nearly the end of the Bible, we find, we find men who had more than one wife. 
And can I, can I just interject that it never ended well for him? Amen. Never. And, 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 and can I also just say this, that, that God planned it differently than that. And with everything else that God has planned, man messed it up. Um, God, God brought Adam into the garden and he created him and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now you read it, Genesis chapter number one and God was doing, in chapter number two, God was doing something specific in, in this man, Adam's life. Because Adam is, is looking around the garden and God gave him a task, God gave him a job. He said, your job, Adam, is to name all of the animals. And so God is bringing to Adam all of these animals and Adam is, is noticing something. Something is sticking out to Adam. He, he's noticing that for every animal that looks one way, there's not actually just one, but there's actually two. And, and I, I truly believe that God was, was putting something in Adam. He was placing within him a desire for something that he did not have. And, and I think one of the reasons why God allows us to be born, God allows us to be raised, and maybe even allow, to live, allow us to live some, some years as, as single, single adults and single young people, what God is doing is God is developing within us a desire for something that we currently do not have. And I want you to notice that when God put Adam into that deep sleep, and God opened Adam up and he removed that rib from Adam, and he formed this woman, he, he formed Eve uh, from the rib that had come out of Adam. I want you to know that when Adam woke up, there was just one woman there. This was, this was not a prehistoric you know, episode of The Bachelor. There weren't 20 or 30 women for Adam to choose from. God created one person for him. That's it. That was God's plan. God is, God is showing us, listen, I have a plan. And by the way, if you will just sit back and relax, some of you single folks in here, if you'll just chill out a little bit, God can do the same thing to you that he did for Adam. If you'll just sit back and say, God, it's in your hands. Would I, would I like to be married by now? Absolutely, but it just hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to force the issue. I'm going to sit back like Adam did, and I'm going to let you bring that person into my life. And that's a wise decision. That's a wise way to live our lives. And we find here that God brought one man into the garden. He created one woman, and he brought them together. There was nobody else that was to be a part of this marriage relationship. Can I tell you that we find here, he says in verse number five, that a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And I, as I said a moment ago, a marriage will struggle if there's too much involvement from the outside, be it mother or father even. On August the 5th of 2000, when I married my wife, my relationship with my parents, my relationship with my brothers, my relationship with my friends and my family it did not cease to exist, but it did change. And a man needs to understand that before he gets married. And a woman needs to understand that before she gets married. If she is going to have a marriage that is going to be fulfilling, if he is going to have a marriage that is going to be fulfilling, it must be between one man and one woman. Faithfulness. Can I say number three, God's plan for marriage was given to us by Jesus, addresses gender, it addresses monogamy, but number three, it addresses permanence. Notice verse six. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. You know what God is saying here? God's saying what I have brought together, don't mess it up. Don't tear it apart. Don't walk away from it. Fight for it. Survive, do what you've got to do, but stay together. That is my plan. Now, there seems to be one caveat to this in Scripture. In Matthew 5 and verses 31 and 32, and also repeated here in Matthew 19 and verse number 9, Jesus says this, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. God, God, God says basically, I, there, there's, only, there's only one way in which God says I will even allow for divorce. And that one way is if except there be marital infidelity. If there be, if there be adultery, if there be unfaithfulness, while it was never my plan, it was never my desire, but God seems to, 
to allow for a man or for a woman to put away a spouse as long as they were faithful, as long as they were true and they were right, God seems to allow one caveat for divorce. And yet the world's attitude, as we've already highlighted, is divorce for every cause. This is simply not God's plan. You say, well, why is this so important? Why does it really matter? Let me close with this. Can I share with you thirdly the portrait that is clearly seen in marriage according to Scripture? As we close, I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5, we find that, that our marriage is not only significant because it expresses the love that we have for our spouse, and our marriage is not only significant because through that we bring other children into this world and we create a family together and all of the beautiful things that come as a result of that, but our marriage is significant because as we, as we live in a Christian marriage, in a Christian home, we are... We are, we are shining a light for all to see. We're shining a portrait. We're, we're showing forth a picture of something. You say, well, what is that picture? I think it's two things. First of all, our marriage is a picture of the relationship that Christ has with his church. Amen. Notice in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Can I tell you that the wife submits herself to her husband in the same way. In a Christian marriage, a wife submits herself to a husband in the same way that, that the church submits itself to Christ. And is this happening in most marriages? Perhaps it is not. Is this happening in most churches? Perhaps it is not either, but this is still God's plan. And so we have a choice to make. We're either, going to, we're either going to continue to disregard the clear teaching of Scripture or we're going to determine that we're going to get ourselves in line with what this book says. I'm, talk, I'm, I'm not just talking to wives and their submission or yieldedness to their husbands right now, but I'm also talking to the members of Cleveland Baptist Church in our submission, our yieldedness to God as our groom because we are his bride. And so our, our marriages are, are picturing something. And when the world sees a wife who is submitting to her husband, allowing him to lead. A world is, is seeing not just a, an unusual marriage, but they're also seeing a picture of the church. Amen. Not only is the wife to submit herself to the husband as the church submits to Christ, but notice the husband is the sacrifice for his wife as Christ sacrificed himself for the church. Amen. You see, we hear a lot of times preaching of wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Get in line. Wow, men, do we have a great responsibility. Boy, do we have, a, we have some heavy burden laying on us that we are to love our wives and we are to give ourselves to our wives as Christ gave himself to the church. That's the picture that our marriages show. So why is it significant? Why is it important that you live your life in this way? Why is your marriage significant? Because it's picturing something. Can I say, secondly, not only is our marriage a picture of the relationship Christ has with his church, but I believe our marriage is a picture of the relationship Christ has with those who are saved. In Revelation 21, in verse number 9, the saved in heaven at the end of time are called and reference the bride of Christ. How does marriage, or physical marriages, how does it mirror the relationship that one might have with the Lord Jesus Christ, them being the bride and him being the groom, well, because a marriage is a relationship between two people. And God, listen, Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with you this morning. Marriage is designed to last a lifetime. And I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, there may be someone in this room, you do not know Jesus Christ in this personal way that we're talking about. And yet, if you were to respond to the invitation in just a moment, you were to receive Jesus Christ, it would be a relationship that would not just last, last a lifetime, but it would be a relationship that would last for all of eternity. Marriage is a covenant between two people. And I want you to know something. The covenant of grace exists to draw you in, to pull you to Christ and to himself that it might change you. Marriage is fulfilling. Marriage done well, marriage done God's way is fulfilling. I'm telling you, if you've never met Jesus Christ, you can meet him today and your whole spirit and your whole life can be forever changed and you never long for anything ever again. Marriage is 
designed to be fulfilling the relationship with Christ was fulfilling marriage is a gift. It's God's gift to us. Jesus Christ is offering a gift to you this morning. The marriage is a choice. I chose to marry the woman that I married almost 18 years ago. And I choose every day to stay married to her. She chooses every day to stay married to me. And you need to choose sometime before your life comes to a conclusion. You need to choose Jesus Christ to be your groom. You need to choose yourself and allow yourself to be his bride. I could go on and on. But for every statement, again, that I, I could make about marriage, I could make the same statement about the relationship that those who are saved enjoy with Jesus Christ and their Heavenly Father. I'm not here to discourage you or frustrate you. For those of you who perhaps have experienced a difficult relationship in marriage and maybe it has ended poorly, but I am here to tell you that your experience does not negate what God's plan is. And God's plan is clearly laid out in Matthew chapter number 19. And should God allow you to go on and perhaps pick the pieces of your life back together? Uh, or perhaps maybe there's a single young person here saying, I, I want to be married and I want to enjoy that relationship. God clearly spells out, here is what it's supposed to look like. One man, one woman. The two become one, no outside influences for all of life. And why is it significant? Because it pictures the relationship that Jesus Christ has with all of us, the bride of Christ, as it pertains to this church and then also as it pertains to you and your own individual and personal life. 